Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'll be giving my talk in English as well. Um, and as I saw yesterday with my colleague Matti's um, uh, presentation, our Rijksmuseum uh, font seems to do strange things here in France. It's a very interesting uh, modernistic um, font we're dealing with here. So we'll see how that goes during this talk. Um, I'm going to start with something that's actually not a paper negative. Um, and if you compare the beginnings of photography with today's imaging technology, um, at first glance, you're not going to discover any great similarities. However, if you take a closer look, it becomes obvious that photographic practice has returned to its origins. The daguerreotype of the 1840s has much more in common with a snapshot on a mobile phone than almost all of the photographic processes that were in use between that first photograph and the last photograph. Both processes depict someone dear to you, and um, the protective case is small enough to be taken anywhere. Both images are crystal clear and extremely sharp, and each is protected by a sheet of glass. Viewing the images can be either a rewarding or a disappointing um, experience, depending on the lighting and the presence or absence of disturbing reflections. Both of these images are physically present, in one form or, or another, of course, but each must be viewed in a very particular way if one wants to fully appreciate it. And in this sense, they are very similar to paper negatives because you need to play with light. You have to have light coming from the surface, coming through the negative, light coming from different directions in order to really experience that object, that photographic object, the way it was perhaps meant to be experienced. So that's why I think um, just thinking about the interaction of light and the, and the object and the ambient light, the situation you're in, um, especially in a museum such as ours and many others that have a storage facility, um, a restoration atelier, they have a study room, they have the exhibition galleries, and they have an online presence with a digital image. All these, all these different situations may call for different ways of handling these, these uh, objects. So Mati Bohm, my, my colleague, already introduced the negatives that the Rijksmuseum has, the paper negatives that the Rijksmuseum has. And they always hold a special place in photographic collections. And while heritage professionals are de dedicated to preserving them for the future, we also need to make them accessible to the public, as I mentioned, in a reading room, for example, or in an exhibition, so that their history and technology can be better understood. And as a result, uh, we tend to spend more time and resources on, these, um, on the conservation of, of these objects than we might for other collection materials. In 2013, a student from the Cologne University of Applied Sciences, uh, Matthias Kuhlenkötter, came to the Rijksmuseum to learn more about paper negatives. He did extensive research on historical recipes and also care carefully examined our negatives, which at that time had not been given the attention that they deserved. In order to better understand the materials and techniques and in order to be able to describe the negatives properly, Matthias proceeded to rec recreate a number of paper negatives following historic processes. So for each recipe, Matthias examined variants and he also tried out the same recipe on different papers. As a result, he produced dozens of calotypes, or paper negatives, that's still um, an issue about terminology, which perhaps we can discuss later on, that all look different, thereby illustrating the great variety of possible appearances of a paper negative. So the unwaxed or only waxed after development processes that he tried were those by Talbot, by Blanca Evra, by William Holland Furlon, by Amélie Guillaume Saget, and by Charles Negre. And the pre-wax processes that he um, recreated were those of uh, Le Grey, uh, Thomas Keith, uh, James Howe, William Henry Burbank, and Hermann Kronen. And to better understand the difference between the results, Matthias also made cross-sections of his negatives. Cross-sections are very useful in the examination of layered materials. And while paper negatives aren't really layered materials in that sense, although some of them may have coatings on them, um, the cross-section does give you a lot of information about how deep the, the silver, for example, penetrates into the paper support. For example, in the unwaxed negative made with Talbot's recipe at top, the silver image has penetrated far into the paper fiber structure, whereas in the unwaxed negre negative at bottom, the recipe includes the use of gelatin, which appears to keep the silver closer to the top of the sheet. And if you compare a pre-waxed negre negative at top to a negative that was both pre-waxed and then post-waxed after processing at bottom, it becomes clear that the act of adding a second impregnation um, of wax after wet processing seems to make the negative more compact and give it a smoother surface. Scanning electron microscope, or SEM analysis, of these cross-sections 
gives us a much better idea of the function of wax as an impregnant as well. In comparison to the unwaxed Talbot negative at left, the uh, pre- and post-waxed Negre negative at right has a much more compact and, and dense structure. And you can see the wax has penetrated um, throughout the paper and filled all of the interstices between the fibers, which makes the, uh, it more uh, translucent, of course. Finally, it's interesting to compare prints made from these samples. Um, the smoothest, most compact negative, that of the pre- and post-waxed Negre recipe, gives the sharpest image of the three shown here. So conservation and restoration issues are, of course, a central part of our work at the museum. And wax paper negatives, as you all know, are very sensitive to handling because creases will cause micro microscopic breaks in the wax impregnant that appear as whitish streaks in the negative and the dark lines that we see when the negative is viewed with transmitted light. And after a careful examination of the negatives and much discussion with the curators, the decision was made to only stabilize the physically damaged edges, such as we see here, but not to restore the typical white lines that occur in the areas that are creased. And we had three reasons for this, really. First of all, the reasons or the, the creases are seen as part of the history of the object. They're not causing imminent problems uh, to the object, as far as we can tell, and would not continue to grow or change in any way once the negative is securely stabilized by mounting it. And the restoration would be irreversible as well. So in essence, we felt that the white wax streaks that we're seeing could always be removed at a later date, or reduced, let's say, at a later date um, if necessary. But for us at this point in time, we didn't really see a good reason to do that. And part of our considerations were based on evidence that we had um, in some of the cases that creases and tears had already been there at the time that the print was made in the 19th century. So for example, in this salted paper print by Charles, Neg Charles Negre, um, you can see the um, you can see here these, these artifacts, essentially, that come from the original tear and perhaps slight mend in the negative. As physically sensitive objects, paper negatives need some form of stabilization, however, and a rigid support so they can be handled and exhibited without endangering them. And we chose to mount the negatives with false margins. So those are large or wide strips of Japanese paper at each edge that allow the negatives to be mounted in mats so that the whole sheet is visible. These margins are adhered to the paper side of the negative with very narrow strips of thin Japanese paper that overlaps the negative by two millimeters right here. Um, these strips are applied, again, with Clusel-G. We just heard uh, Clusel-G being used. Um, we use it in ethanol. Um, and basically, they're invisible to the naked eye. And I thank my, my former colleague, uh, Lenia Fernandez, who did, who did this work and devised this. So the negative is with its false paper margins is then um, mounted, and you can see it sort of here in a schematic cross-section. The false margins, the paper negative, um, it's mounted to a window mat with an incorporated sheet of acrylic on the back. Um, that acrylic gives it a physical support. The rigid support is then mounted between two window mats of uh, thick board um, around the edges with beveled windows. And then two covers are applied, one on the front and one on the back, to give it a physical protection um, against um, impact, but also, of course, against light and dust. And this method of housing has proven very useful to us because um, we do have a study room. Um, it is possible to come and see our negatives in that study room. And we can show them in both incident light as well as transmitted light without having to handle the object. And in addition, the housing fits into our standard sized frames for exhibition. We've heard about XRF examination, and it's something that we're also involved in at the Rijksmuseum. And I just want to give one brief example. And um, we, I find that during the talks here, it's interesting to see how similar ideas and results come up as well. So using XRF um, uh, analysis, we found that, um, well, as you know, you can see the ele elemental composition of materials. And Rosina Herrera, my colleague who's also here today, has been doing a lot of this analysis at, at the museum. So here, for example, at left, we can see a fixed paper negative uh, Talbot recipe. And this is also from Matthias' um, tests that he did. And the XRF spectrum of a highlight of this print indicates that only a minimal peak of silver is present, as we can see right here. Um, but really, there are no other um, image or no other elements that we, we would relate to the image. We do have high calcium peaks. And as we find those very often in paper, we don't relate this to the image. Um, Compare this to the spectrum of a similar area on a Talbot rest, uh, I'm sorry, on a, yes, also on a Talbot recipe negative that has not been fixed, but that was stabilized in um, potassium iodide. And you can also, you can see the color here, which is quite typical for that type of 
of negative as well. And we do find that in the highlight we have um, very large amounts of silver and we also have very large peaks of iodine. iodine. So this is an indication that probably in the highlight we can still have silver iodide, which does make sense and we heard about um, the different methods of stabilizing instead of fixing earlier. And as uh, my colleague Mati Bohm mentioned yesterday, we believe through this analysis that we've been doing that one of the paper negatives created by the first Dutch photographer, um, Eduard Assar, um, was also merely stabilized with potassium bromide. Um, so we do think that it's probably quite a light sensitive negative and we're being especially careful with that. And this is ongoing research as well. So in view of an upcoming um, exhibition of paper negatives, um, and in the context of his master's thesis in Cologne, Matthias Kuhlenkötter performed accelerated light aging tests with a number of dummies that he had made. Um, he concentrated on Talbot's and Negre's methods because those were the negatives we were planning to show. And on this slide, we see samples of, a fixed, of fixed negatives at left, negatives stabilized with potassium iodide at center, and stabilized with potassium bromide at right. And since we were planning to backlight our negatives with an LED panel, and since our gallery spotlights also use LED, Matthias chose an LED light source for his experiments. The source was free of UV, as are our lights in the gallery, and could be set at the high intensity of 2,550 lux. The samples were exposed for four weeks, 24 hours a day, resulting in 1,713,600 lux hours of exposure, which would be equivalent to approximately 10 years of exposure at 50 lux for nine hours a day. Matthias used a densitometer with transmitted light, as you can see here, to measure um, changes. So after aging, it turned out that the fixed sample did not change. And what you're seeing here then is always the control sample at left and the aged sample at right. Um, so the fixed sample did not change much. Um, the unaged control strip is on the left. Oh, I've just mentioned this. Both of the stabilized samples uh, changed quite dramatically, however, during this test. And um, the maximum change that we found here was um, 0 0.4 um, density value. Matthias did the same tests with the Negre um, recipes, and we found much fewer changes because they had all been, um, at least in his samples, they had all been fixed. Um, but there were variants within those, within those samples. And I'll only highlight one comparison here, really. That's this one, showing almost no difference, a maxi maximum density change of 0 0.02, which is actually within the error margin of, of the um, densitometer that Matthias was using. He did find that slight bleaching of the beeswax was occurring. So these tests made me ponder about the light sensitivity of historic paper negatives. Of course, these are all modern samples and they hadn't been aged before their light uh, testing. So of course, there are some issues there that you know, may not be very good. And we all know that accelerated light uh, testing is not equivalent to natural aging, obviously. But it did make me think about what paper negatives were originally made for, and that is, of course, to produce prints. And so they were made for putting out in the sun. Uh, multiple times with a lot of intensity of light shining on them. And it made me wonder about light sensitivity of, um, of paper negatives. And at our museum, we don't use a microfadometer um, such as the one we just saw. So we didn't really have a lot of means to, to test the negatives in advance as, as we just saw. There are various reasons we don't use microfadometers at the museum. Um, I should also mention that Matthias continued testing with UV-rich uh, lights and, of course, got very, very drastic results. It was just to prove the point that UV is, of course, um, a damaging light source. So it was obviously excluded from our exhibitions. This was then in 2015, the exhibition Shadow and Light that Matti also mentioned yesterday. And we put up a number of paper um, negatives and also um, early salted paper prints in the gallery. It was up for three months, which is our typical um, exhibition time in the photo gallery. And you can see the LED spots hanging here from the ceiling. And uh, some of the negatives had been backlit um, in the frames as well. So in preparation for this exhibition, we spent some time looking for the right light source to backlight the negatives. And given Matthias' test results, we were really looking for thin light panels that would fit behind the frames on the walls, um, something like the LED panel depicted here. However, at the time, we couldn't find an LED panel that was thin enough to fit between the frame and the wall and at the same time be invisible to the visitor. And we did stumble across these um, EL light sheets. And EL stands for electroluminescence. And um, it's a phosphor um, compound that fluoresces when a current is applied to it. They're paper thin, they're flexible, and they're a little odd because when light reflects off them, they appear pink. But when you shade that light, 
you get this bluish fluorescence. And I have to say that in this image, it's a bit exaggerated. They're not really as blue as they look here. But they are a bit bluish. Um, we did compare the emission spectra of these two panels, and uh, we found both of them don't have um, any UV um, radiation in them. And in fact, neither of them get warm either. There's no real IR to speak of at all. And the EL sheet did have this gap between 650 and 700 that I think is probably, or probably accounts for the bluish tone that we're seeing here. So we did some preliminary tests with colored filters in a darkened room, and they were promising. Here's an amber colored filter behind the negative on an EL sheet. Because the EL sheet has a bluish um, hue, we felt that with an amber filter we could we could essentially imitate what we're seeing on an LED panel using a neutral density filter. And if you actually look at these two filtered areas, they do resemble each other quite a lot. But then it turned out that actually when we were hanging the negatives with the EL sheets behind them, it was extremely difficult to get the right color. So we're playing with filters here. And what, what happened, I think, was that we have a warmish gallery lighting, as do most museums. And that warmish gallery lighting, uh, in addition to the cream-colored passepartouts, that we were using sort of gave our eyes this sort of warm, warm uh, sense, let's say. And then we had this sort of bluish, greenish backlit negative. And I think th this complementary color was sort of making us see the complementary colors even more than, than they actually were there. So this actually was a very, very difficult exercise. And it wasn't completely satisfying in the end. Um, it also made me question what color a negative has anyway. How do you look at a negative, and what is its color? So we have professional photographers at the museum. And of course, they'll take very good pictures. That's their job. So the paper side um, of a paper negative, the image side of a paper negative, and then the transmitted light um, image of that paper negative taken by our imaging department. And they work with the same light sources. They use flash um, for all of these images. So to take the transmitted light, they create a, a light box using their flashes and the light reflects up through the negative. So we're really trusting their, um, their, their color calibration here. But when you then start doing condition checks of a paper negative using a different light source, because of course we're not using their flash lights to do our con condition reporting, um, it gets a little bit complicated. We had their images on an iPad because we felt it would give us a similar sort of luminescence um, of that negative. But it turns out, of course, that the iPad has its own color quality. and the light panels we were using, the LED panels, to do the condition check have a different light than the flash used by the, um, by the photographers. So here especially, we were seeing that in this area here at the corners, um, on the iPad, we had a sort of neutral corner, whereas here, the whole negative appeared sort of neutral. And it was a little odd. And of course, when you think about it, and you look at the image taken with reflected light, then it's the retouching at that edge that is giving that neutral color. So this was a little concerning because we, we want to do a condition check and record perhaps a yellowing of that image. But if we don't have a reference, or if we can't show the negative with the same brownish tone that it has on our control image, then it's, it's a little difficult to make that comparison. So looking at the negative in a darkened room, as we were doing there, and looking at a negative in the gallery, where it's backlit, is actually quite different as well. So here we have the same negative on show um, with the backlit light. And actually, we didn't only have the light coming through the negative, but we also had light shining from the spots in the gallery at the surface of the ne negative to bring out a bit of that paper structure. But when you shielded the, the spotlight with your hand, then you would remove that sort of warmish tint that we're still seeing here because now we have the pure transmitted light from the EL sheet, which admittedly is also too blue. So it's a little difficult here. The colors tend to, um, tend to shift depending on how you're, you're illuminating your negative and how you're looking at it. It really complicates matters when you're trying to do on-site condition reporting during an exhibition. Um, after the exhibition, we found when we took down the frames, we found that the light sheets had changed quite dramatically. Um, you can see that one of them is darker than the other, and they were initially all the same intensity. And in addition, I'll just um, enlarge this, you can see it's become quite patchy. So the uniformity of the light sheet had changed during those three months as well. Um, there's one other thing that I should mention about these light sheets. I didn't have a problem with it, but my younger colleagues did. They emit a very high-pitched tone. And I wasn't, I couldn't hear it, luckily. But some of the uh, younger colleagues, they didn't want to go into the photo gallery because they, had, they perceived that high-pitched tone there. 
So for our latest show with paper negatives, which was New Realities, which we had on, um, on this summer at the Rijksmuseum, um, we were able to find LED light panels that were thin enough, they're only eight millimeters thick, um, that fit very nicely behind our frames and were invisible to, um, to the visitors. Um, they don't have that bluish hue, they look very neutral. Um, they uh, don't give off any heat and they don't contain any UV. Um, it seemed like actually the ideal, the ideal type of, of sheet or panel, I should say. We could dim them, but we still had to add extra neutral density filters in order to reduce the intensity of the, of the light. Um, but the question is, how bright should a negative be in an exhibition? And this is difficult because here, for example, you're seeing three negatives. Um, on the left, we see a negative by Fox Talbot, which was not waxed and was actually quite dark on the back due to some probable intervention by Harold White in the 1950s. Um, and if we had backlit that negative, it would just look very muddy and dark. So we decided to have that negative with only incident light on the front, whereas the two Negre negatives we did backlight because they were waxed and you could really tickle out that, that quality of them. But how bright should a negative be? Now, of course, there are conservation um, considerations, but there's also the aesthetic consideration. And I think that's an important one to, to consider. So another issue was that we're mixing light sources again. So we have the gallery lighting, which is LED, but it's a warm LED. And then we have the LED panels behind the negatives, which is more sort of a neutral LED. So for the negatives, we're really mixing two different light sources. And we're probably not showing them. It's not really fair, let's say, because we're showing the unwaxed negative with only one light source, a warm light and the other ones we're showing with a mix of warm and cool light. So are we really showing the negatives as we should be showing them? Are we giving the visitors the, the correct experience? That's something I'm not really sure about, and I think we might be able to improve in the future. Ideally, we would have to have the same LEDs for the backlighting than we are using in the, in the galleries for the incident lighting. Now, I shouldn't fail to mention that we are doing, um, we are doing monitoring of these negatives. Um, we're really using... Um, Right now, we're using a spectral photometer. We're measuring L in LAB values. As Sarah just explained, I don't need to go into detail for that. And we're usually looking at three spots. We're looking at a highlight, a midtone, and a shadow. Right now, we're looking at, um, at two, well, we're looking at the image side and at the paper side of the negatives. Um, what I'd really like to do, though, is try and figure out how to do that on, on, you know, with transmitted light. And our device does allow for transmitted light measurements, but you need to have you need to have the same light source, essentially. And it's difficult to calibrate that. So I'd be curious to hear how others are doing this um, and how they're monitoring changes in transmitted light and not just in incident light, because I think this might be, be able to improve our, um, our techniques. So the Rijksmuseum does not, as a rule, use buttons in exhibitions. Um, it's, it's a decision by the director, and um, I think the idea is that the director does not want the visitors touching anything, and even if it's just a button. The, I think the idea behind it is if you touch a button, then you can also touch the sculpture because um, you're allowed to touch things. You know, it's, it's a policy. Um, and we're trying to deal with this in some way or other. Um, I do think that as we move along and as we understand more about these objects, we'll need to consider using these techniques. And I've, I've seen, of course, in other museums that this is used quite a lot. One of the other arguments against these buttons in our museum is that the wall would look um, broken, let's say, that some, some frames wouldn't be illuminated properly and the visitors would walk by them thinking, the light's, the light's not on, um, something's broken there. To be honest, I don't really believe that because I've seen in other exhibitions that this is not the case, but as a museum professional, I also see the button and I sort of realize what's going on. Um, so there are different ways of looking at this. Um, and I think it's something that we'll be learning as, as we move along into the future. Um, and also our understanding of historical objects is changing all the time, um, so our practice is with it. And as we're learning more and more about paper negatives, and I've been learning quite a lot at this conference, um, we are seeing how these essentially functional m photographs of the past, I mean, they, they weren't made to be just negatives, except as Larry pointed out, Talbot did enjoy them as negatives as well. Um, these functional photographs are becoming more objects that we're showing um, in museums. And as new equipment is also becoming available, I think we'll be able to improve our analysis of these. Um, and we've seen very good examples of that during this conference. Um, I th what I would hope really is that we can, um, and that might be a great result of this conference, is that we can really share the techniques we're using, such as, as we're doing now, 
and come up with a sort of standardized approach to exhibiting these negatives that we can all perhaps agree upon in the future. So illuminating a negative, um, for me, has multiple meanings. Um, light played a role both in making the negative and um, in its original use of creating uh, positives. But light is also necessary to examine these negatives, to illuminate them, to look at them in the study room, and to um, even to restore them. I need good light if I'm going to restore them. So I hope that we too, as museum professionals, will be illuminated in these efforts. And um, that was kind of cheesy, but I had to say it. And um, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and especially my colleagues who, who helped me put together this, uh, this talk. Thank you very much. De nouveau une présentation qui montre les solutions qu'il faut établir et réviser en fonction des différents objets qui sont traités et présentés. Est-ce que vous avez quelques questions Thank you, Martin. I just have a, a little, a small question about uh, uh, your or Matthias aging, accelerated aging. There were th three strips, so control, age, and what was the third one Yeah, good point. Um, the third, so when he aged them, he aged um, one, because it wasn't a transmitted light setup, it was an incident light setup. So he aged one strip from the front and one strip from the back to sort of get an idea of what would happen if light was coming through from the back, basically. It, it was too much, you know, detail to go into during a, a short talk like this. Yeah, good, good question. Uh, Martin? Yes. I just have a comment. Uh, in the National Library of Norway, when we have exhibited several times, um, negative material on a backlit uh, uh, light table, we used uh, motion detectors yeah. so that people coming very close to it would have that illuminated for true, a yeah. few seconds. So yeah. that's yeah. a way of avoiding the push-button no, thing. No, it's very true. And we, we had considered that as well. But here again, the policy of the museum was that um, you would essentially walk into a gallery and you would see a wall that wasn't, wasn't very bright, wasn't very light, whereas the prints were illuminated. And if then suddenly the light turned on, it would give the sense that something wasn't working properly. Like I said, these are policy issues of a museum, and they have to be addressed at a higher level than, than the individual object at the moment, in any case. Yeah. Yeah, but that's a good point. Thank you. Yeah. J'avais une question toute générale. À, à quelle température et à quelle humidité uh, vous conservez les uh, calotypes? Okay. So um, it, at our museum right now, we keep them in the standard... Um, uh, pardon, je, je ne peux pas répondre en français. <laughs> um, we keep them in the standard uh, photo storage, which has uh, 17 degrees Celsius, uh, 17 uh, degrees, and 45% um, relative humidity. That's our standard photo um, storage right now. We are building a cool storage, which, going, which is going to have about 5 degrees Celsius, and uh, 40, no, 45 more or less percent relative humidity. But I don't think we'll move the negatives to that storage. They don't um, seem to be the right candidates for that. So they'll probably stay at around 17 degrees 